Hi everyone! Welcome back to the Vanderbilt Institute of Nanoscale Science and Engineering. This week, we're in the Vince Clean Room to learn about removing materials, also known as etching. There are two methods we can use to remove materials, wet etching or dry etching. Wet etching uses a liquid chemical to remove material from the surface. In contrast, dry etching uses a plasma to remove material from a surface. Today, we'll etch SiO2, or glass, using wet and dry methods. Wet etching is a bit like doing the dishes. We pick a chemical, like dish soap, that dissolves the material we want to get rid of, like waste food, but does not react with the substrate we are working on, like the ceramic plate. Then, we place the sample in the chemical and wait, like letting a dish soak. Sometimes we add a small amount of energy in the form of heat or agitation to increase the rate of etching, but usually just leaving the substrate in a bath of the chemical is sufficient. A good example of this is etching an SiO2 layer on a silicon wafer using hydrofluoric acid, or HF. This chemical will etch glass very rapidly and silicon slowly. The fluoride ions in the mixture react with the silicon ions in the glass to create SiF6 ions, which are soluble in water. Meanwhile, the leftover oxygen ions react with hydrogen ions to become water. When we place a wafer patterned with photoresist into the acid, only the parts that are not covered by the photoresist are etched. This leaves behind the desired pattern in SiO2. Then, we can remove the photoresist by wet etching or rinsing it with acetone, leaving behind our pattern in Si and SiO2. Here is a sample of SiO2 on silicon before and after wet etching. Hydrofluoric acid is extremely hazardous and can cause severe chemical burns, so Alice is wearing extra PPE, including an apron, face mask, gloves, and chemically resistant sleeves to work with the acid. Most other materials can be etched in the same way just by choosing the right chemical. For example, here we etch aluminum patterned with photoresist using a mixture of phosphoric, acetic, and nitric acids. The advantage of wet etching is that it is simple to do and relatively low cost. There also tends to be good selectivity between the material you want to etch, like the glass, and the material you don't want to etch, like the photoresist. However, wet etching is isotropic, which means it etches the same in every direction. This means that as you etch, you end up with a hemispherical etch profile and get a large undercut to your features. This can cause problems if you need specific high aspect ratio features like posts or trenches. Perhaps the most frequently used wet etch in the clean room is a process called liftoff. This is when the photoresist is removed from underneath a deposited layer to remove or lift off unwanted parts of the film and leave behind a pattern. Most frequently, acetone is used to dissolve the photoresist, but sometimes this leaves an unwanted organic residue on the sample, and N-methyl-2-pyrrolidone, or NMP, is used instead. Liftoff is unusual as the layer we wish to remove is underneath the desired material. Therefore, we must use a thick layer of photoresist with a negative sidewall profile to ensure the solvent can reach the photoresist without damaging the liftoff layer. Here is a metal layer removed by acetone with sonication. Dry etching uses a plasma to remove materials. A plasma is an ionized gas which in the clean room is generated by putting a large electric field across a chamber containing a flow of gas. The gas selected depends on the material you want to etch. For SiO2, or silicon, we would use a fluorine-containing gas, like CF4 or SF6, to generate fluorine ions in the plasma, which, as we know from wet etching, react with the silicon ions in SiO2 to remove material. For organic materials, like photoresist, we use an oxygen plasma. For metals, like aluminum, we use a chlorine-containing plasma. Here is an example of an etch recipe that we use for SiO2. The important parameters to note here are the etch gases selected, O2 and CF4, the pressure in the chamber, 150 millitor, and the power, 
500 watts ICP and 25 watts parallel plate. You may recall from the deposition video that in PECVD we used a pressure of 1000 millitor. Here, we use significantly lower pressures as we wish to remove materials instead of deposit them. You may also notice that there are two power sources in the recipe, ICP and RIE. This reflects the two distinct mechanisms of dry etching. The first is chemical. Ions from the plasma react with the etched material forming gaseous products that can be removed from the chamber. The second is mechanical. The plasma has so much energy that it knocks atoms off the sample, which is known as sputtering. Chemical etching is selective. Only the desired materials tend to be etched, while the sputtering is not, and all materials get etched. However, chemical etching is isotropic, which etches the same in every direction while sputtering is anisotropic and etches faster in the direction in which the plasma is accelerated. Thus, by balancing the two mechanisms, anisotropic structures like trenches and posts can be etched into materials. The inductively coupled plasma or ICP power source is responsible for increasing or decreasing the density of the plasma and thus the rate of chemical etching. It is located in a coil around the top of the chamber, insulated from it by a ceramic tube. Putting power through it generates plasma but does not accelerate the ions in a given direction. The parallel plate power, labeled RIE on this tool, is responsible for accelerating the ions in the plasma towards the sample. Electrodes are placed at the top and bottom of the chamber, and power results in a DC bias which accelerates ions towards the plate. Larger power results in more anisotropic structures, but also more sputtering, which can remove the etch mask before the required etch depth is reached. Typically, a ratio of around 10 to 1 is used for ICP and parallel plate power. However, each recipe must be optimized for each sample to ensure that the desired rate, anisotropy, and selectivity are achieved. Here is a sample of SiO2 on silicon before and after dry etching. When very high aspect ratio features are required, special techniques must be used, known as deep reactive ion etching. An example of this is the Bosch process. A Bosch process is used to etch high aspect ratio features into silicon. It consists of three steps, deposition, breakthrough, and etch. In the deposition step, a C4F8 plasma with no bias or acceleration towards the sample is used to deposit a polymeric layer across the sample. In the second step, breakthrough, an SF6 plasma is accelerated towards the sample with a bias and etches anisotropically through the C4F8 polymeric layer. Finally, in the etch step, an SF6 plasma is used to etch isotropically into the silicon. Each gas mixture results in a different colored plasma gas, as you can see through the chamber window. You will also notice each step lasts only for a few seconds, making this process challenging for the tool itself to perform. We use the Oxford Plasma Pro for this process, as it is designed for deep reactive ion etching. As the deposition step is repeated, the sidewalls and bottom of the etched part get coated in the C4F8 polymeric layer. However, in the breakthrough step, the polymeric layer is only removed at the bottom of the trench, so the next etch step will only etch down into the sample and not outwards, resulting in a deep anisotropic etch. The cycle of steps can be repeated until the desired etch depth is reached, with each cycle approximately etching one micron deep. We have used this etch to go all the way through a silicon wafer with reasonable uniformity. Here are samples before and after a Bosch etch has been performed. Hi, hi my, my name is uh, Kalana and I'm a researcher in Vanderbilt University. And I use the WINS uh, clean room to do Bosch etch process. So our my etch substrates are used to create well patterns. So what it does is actually, it's, it's like creating a well and with a 200 micrometer or so depth and uh, this well would help me to grow cancer cells in spheroid formation which is a fancy way of saying 3D growth of uh, cancer cells. Hi, my name is Amari Paul. I'm a graduate student in the Tiger Lab uh, at Tennessee State University. 
I used the Vince Clean Room to wedge etch gold and chromium on a PVDF substrate using a photoresist etch mask. Now, my etch device is a surface acoustic wave device which takes AC electrical signal as input and transduces that into a mechanical signal and then ultimately takes that mechanical signal and transduces it back into an electrical signal. So this device is used to detect uh, small uh, frequency changes in the signal or the output signal of the device and ultimately that has a correlation to the mass loading on the device itself. In the Vince Clean Room, we can etch many materials using wet and dry methods. A full list of the tools and chemicals available for these processes can be found on the Vince website at vu.edu forward slash V-I-N-S-E. The samples etched here are incorporated into research all across Vanderbilt from nanophotonic devices to cell habitats. Join us next time to learn more about microfabricated devices.